We continue on the path of loneliness today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day, to not be satisfied with just a little religion when we could have much more. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others. They were all influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today, part three and four of our eight-part series, The Path of Loneliness, a refuge for our loneliness and distinguishing loneliness and solitude. Our guest will be archivist Bob Schuster with his summary on Elizabeth as direct and intellectual. Also, one of uh, Elizabeth's friends, Della Healy, will talk about Elizabeth's legacy. That's coming later. Right now, though, it's Gateway to Joy 17, The Path of Loneliness, A Refuge for Our Loneliness. Hey, when a storm comes upon us, we want a place of refuge, don't we? You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about loneliness, particularly about a refuge for our loneliness. The verse that I've been quoting in my greeting to you every day is from Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. It says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy before thee. That was a very favorite verse of my father's, and my father was a man who lived in the word of God. He used to get up every morning very early, usually between 4.30 and 5, in order to spend time alone with God. That has had a tremendous lasting influence on all six of his children. I'm so grateful for a father like that who taught us about God, who loved him, who lived by his word, who lived consistently. And I'm grateful that my father loved all created things, everything that God had made. He taught us to love the glory of the mountains. We used to have a summer place up in New Hampshire, the White Mountains. And one of the most exciting days would be when my father would get up early and go out and take a, a long look at the weather and decide that this was a mountain day. And he, he would tell my mother to start packing a lunch, and so she would pack a huge lunch and we would have lots of fun packing the lunches into what were called knapsacks in those days, not backpacks. They were really much smaller than modern-day backpacks. And we would fill our canteens, old World War I canteens, from the cold spring water that flowed from a faucet on our porch. And we would set off for Lafayette, which was the highest mountain in the Franconia Range. I can remember my father cutting walking sticks for each of us, very sturdy sticks that he would cut from a tree and then carve our initials in the handle. And I always felt very important and very tough and rugged when I would get my blue jeans on. That was the only time I ever wore blue jeans until I was, uh, well, I hate to say, probably about 50 years old. But back in those days, we did wear blue jeans for mountain climbing, and I had a pair of climbing boots, and I would put that rugged stick in my hand and put my knapsack on my back and follow my father up the trail. And as we began up the trail, it would be very beautiful, deciduous, hardwood forests, and there would be certain kinds of birds there that my father recognized immediately and could imitate. And he taught us to identify the trees, the ash from the maple, the maple from the rock maple, the rock maple from the beach. He taught us to recognize some of the birds. He did his best to teach us a lot more than we ever learned. He could identify probably uh, several hundred birds, and he offered prizes if we could identify 25 or 50 or 75, and there were different graded prizes for each of those, and I don't think I ever won anything except the beginner's bird book. But he did give us a deep love for those mountains and for everything in them. As we climbed, we would get into fir and pine and balsam forest where the perfume was just delicious. 
and there would be different birds there, and the ground and the rocks would become different. And then the most exciting part of the trip to me was always when we burst out of the trees above the timberline where there were nothing but rocks, and we could see for maybe 25 miles over to Mount Washington and other mountains closer by. And that wonderful air, that vast vista, the song of the birds, the cold spring water that we would drink from little bubbling springs beside the trail, I loved probably primarily because I saw that my father loved them. We take our tastes from our parents. The freshness of the dawn the mystery of the night sky. I thank God that he made those things and he made them for our enjoyment. And my father was always reminding us of the fact that it was the Lord who made those, the little birds whom he could imitate with such perfect accuracy, each one different, each one designed by the Lord of the universe, the one who loved us, the one whose word we were taught to revere and to memorize and to listen to quietly in family prayers. When I look at the book of Job, I read those magnificent passages about who God is. You remember poor old Job. He was a man who suffered tremendously. He was sitting on his ash heap, scraping his boils with a broken piece of a pot and complaining to God and asking questions and very disgusted with the flat platitudes that his friends were mouthing to him. And the Lord doesn't say a word in that book for chapter after chapter after chapter. You hear the so-called friends of Job explaining to Job exactly why these miseries have happened to him. It's all his fault. He's obviously a sinner, and no wonder God has had to punish him like this. And Job is sitting there having to put up with all of this preaching, And then Job answers his friends and cries out to God. He really does a lot of howling and screaming at God. And God takes all that in silence. He lets him have his say. And then we come to chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the tempest. Who is this whose ignorant words cloud my design in darkness? Brace yourself and stand up like a man. I will ask questions, and you shall answer. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know and understand. Who settled its dimensions? Surely you should know. Who stretched his measuring line over it? On what do its supporting pillars rest? Who set its cornerstone in place when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted aloud? All of those verses speak to me of order and design and measurement and limitation, the architecture of the universe. But now listen to this, verse 8. Who watched over the birth of the sea when it burst in flood from the womb, when I wrapped it in a blanket of cloud and cradled it in fog? Just think of the Lord of the universe, the one who was the architect and the creator, regarding the sea as an infant, bursting in flood from the womb. He wraps it in a blanket of cloud and cradles it in fog, just as I saw this morning from my window. The Atlantic Ocean cradled in fog. Here is a care which is actually tender, It was the love of God that brought us all into being, sun, stars, winds, men and women, and infants to sweeten the world, to use a phrase from an old prayer which I love. To know God, or even to begin to know him, is to know that we are not alone in the universe. Somebody else is out there. There's a hint that there may be a refuge for our loneliness. To stop our frantic getting, spending, and searching And simply to look at the things God has made is one step away from despair. God cares. The most awesome seascape can reveal a care which is actually tender. 
I wrapped it in a blanket of cloud and cradled it. A god who can look on the mighty ocean as a tiny newborn, could he overlook one of his lonely people? You out there, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm sure that I'm talking to one of those lonely people. Maybe someone who has always felt of God as so remote, never doubted perhaps that he was the creator of the universe, the architect, the one who laid the earth's foundations. You've never doubted anything about that particularly. But how is it possible that such a God can actually see my heart, can actually enter in to the feelings of my loneliness? Does it seem impossible to you? Listen to these verses from that same book of Job. Do you attend the wild doe when she is in labor? Do you count the months that they carry their young or know the time of their delivery when they crouch down to open their wombs? God does that. God is there when the wild doe is in labor. God knows exactly when that baby fawn is due. God watches. God sees them when they crouch down to open their wombs. Do you think your aching heart can possibly escape his notice? It doesn't. He loves you with an everlasting love. And if you will bring that aching heart to him, it will not be despised. And I can tell you that for sure because there's a verse in the Psalms that says, the sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken and a contrite spirit he will not despise. And so I would encourage you to bring that aching heart, that loneliness, as an offering. Get down on your knees, lift up your hands, put your loneliness, put your aching heart, put the emptiness right there in your hands, lift it up to God and say, Lord, please take it. Gateway to Joy 17, a refuge for our loneliness. Later on, we're going to hear about the legacy of Elizabeth Elliot as we hear from Della Healy, a friend of Elizabeth. Right now, Bob Schuster. He's been an archivist at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center Archives for decades, helping researchers learn from the past to understand the present. He found Elizabeth to be direct and intellectual. My strongest impressions were, first of all, of her intense and searching intellect. I remember from our interview her very direct, striking gaze in her eyes. This was a person who saw what was around her, who noted it, who reflected on it, who uh, filtered it through a very powerful and critical intellect. Uh, so I was very impressed with her mind and the fact that um, she was not inclined to sentimentality or to uh, seeing things as she wanted them to be. She wanted to see things as they were. That was Bob Schuster, an archivist at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center Archives. A little later, we hear from Della Healy, a friend of Elizabeth, as she talks about her friend's legacy. Right now, part four of our eight-part series on the path of loneliness. Now, the word loneliness, is it the same as solitude? What's the difference? Solitude is something that we don't really seem to know a whole lot about these days. People seem to avoid it like the plague. They run here, they run there. They try to be with people, have somebody talking to them or music blasting. Solitude has really fallen on hard times, it seems. Loneliness carries a connotation of pain for most of us, where solitude, for some of us at least, is pure pleasure. And I suppose most of us at least have had some experience of wishing for solitude when we were, had been with people and too much noise for too long. But there are people who really find solitude a very painful thing. When we think of solitary confinement, that conjures up 
images of perhaps one of the worst kinds of human pain. But solitude is something for which we should be grateful, something for which we should try to arrange so that we can learn to turn our solitude into prayer. I remember going to a seminar one time. It was a whole day seminar, and I cannot remember anything at all that was said except the very first sentence, which was, you can turn your loneliness into solitude and your solitude into prayer. And that statement has been with me for a long time. Paul Tillich, theologian and philosopher, wrote in his book, The Eternal Now, being alive means being in a body, a body separated from all other bodies, and being separated means being alone. This is true of every creature, and it is more true of man than of any other creature. He is not only alone, he also knows that he is alone. This aloneness he cannot endure, neither can he escape it. It is his destiny to be alone and to be aware of it. Not even God can take this destiny away from him. That's the end of the quotation. When God created the world, he saw each thing that he made as good. But when he made man, he saw that it was not good that man should be alone. Man is a social creature like the animals. They move in pairs or flocks or herds. God designed the answer to Adam's aloneness, a woman. They were a couple meant to answer to each other. Each, however, was still alone in a profound sense, in a separate body, alone before God, bearing his image, answering to him, responsible. This aloneness was a good thing, for everything in the garden was perfect. But something happened. Sin destroyed the perfect harmony of the universe. The relationship of man with God and of human beings with each other was fractured. Man now knows that he is alone. You and I are very much aware of our aloneness. It is not only an experience of solitude, which is not necessarily a bad thing in itself, but it is also an experience of deprivation. We feel that we're missing something, that we've lost something. Human companionship doesn't even suffice in the long run. Disobedience back then in the Garden of Eden is what ruined human companionship. And our aloneness becomes loneliness, a pain in itself. Some of us, as I mentioned, do love solitude, and I love it so much that I actually get up early in the morning in order to guarantee that I have a little bit of it before the phone rings, before anyone comes to the door, before the work of the day has to begin. I get up and I have the great privilege and joy of being able to look out of my front windows over the ocean. Our house is on the coast of Massachusetts and I watch the dawn come up. Our house faces directly south, which means that we get to see both the sunrise and the sunset sunrise on our left and the sunset on our right. I love looking out at the ocean in its peacefulness as it usually is or in its storms. I love watching the sun come up and the gulls fly to the island where they seem to spend the day and then in the evening I sit in my chair and watch the gulls fly back to the island where they spend the night. The island where they spend the day, incidentally for some of you older folks, is Norman's Woe. You remember that poem, The Wreck of the Hesperus? Well, the Hesperus was a ship that was wrecked on Norman's Woe, which is not very far from our house. I love that silence. Just this morning, I was able to sit out on the balcony. It was very misty. In fact, it was foggy. I could hear the sounds of four different foghorns. I love that, too. And my daughter, who lives in Southern California, lives in a very different kind of a place and has a very different life than I do. There's nobody else in the house except my husband and one young man who lives in the back of the house and helps us take care of the place. They're both very quiet. My daughter, on the other hand, is a young mother. She has five children, and 
the oldest is 11. She has told me how difficult it is for her to find a quiet time. I may be speaking with some young mothers who have found it almost impossible to find quiet time. But you'd love to have solitude. It's important that every one of us be alone with God. If not for an hour, then maybe for five minutes. I've asked my daughter how she does it, and she's told me that her schedule, which worked before the children were born, just simply doesn't work. When she has a nursing baby, she may be up two or three times during the night feeding the baby, or she may be up with other children who are sick, one thing and another. You know how it is. And Valerie has said that she has prayed that the Lord will help her to find that quiet time. And sometimes he wakes her up at 3 o'clock in the morning when the house is totally quiet. And she will then get up and spend a little bit of time with the Lord, whatever time she feels that she should spend, given the fact that she does also need to sleep. There have been other times when she hasn't been able to have any time during the night or early in the morning, and she says to her amazement, in answer to prayer, God has seen to it that the children actually took naps, all of them at the same time. She has also arranged a special quiet time for her children in the afternoon. When they're past napping age, each child has to be in his or her own room alone for a whole hour. They can play, they can read, they can sleep if they want to. But she's teaching them what to do with solitude. In Psalm 46, we read, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Now, that's ancient poetic language. But have you ever felt as though your earth had been removed, that everything that you had depended on, like mountains, had suddenly moved somewhere where it didn't belong? God is our refuge at a time like that. And in verse 10, the psalmist says this, Be still and know that I am God. Maybe we could even translate it in modern English, shut up and know that I am God. Be quiet long enough to look up into his face, to speak with him, to lay your needs before him, to open his word and ask him to give you some word of encouragement or comfort or instruction, and to pray. It takes solitude. Are you lonely? Turn your loneliness into solitude and your solitude into prayer. There is so much noise in our lives. Traffic, machinery, chainsaws, lawnmowers, airplanes, phones, dishwashers. Even the music is that shrieking, thundering noise which some people seem to like so much, but which I can hardly bear. Noise, what do we do about it? Maybe you have to go into a closet. Maybe you could go and sit in your car in the garage and get a little bit of quiet for five minutes. Maybe if you're a young mother, you can't go anywhere by yourself because you have to be where you can hear the children, but you can go into the bathroom. You can go somewhere for five minutes or six minutes, whatever fits into your schedule. And remember, the Lord knows all about that schedule. Your work as a young mother is God's work. You are cooperating with him in caring for that child. There is no more important work in the world. And for you older women who are lonely because of the empty nest, I'm going to be talking to you one of these days particularly about that syndrome. But if you have more solitude than you thought you wanted, I urge you to turn that solitude into prayer. One of my favorite hymns that I often use in my own devotional time begins with these lines, Speak, Lord, in the stillness, while I wait on thee, hushed my heart to listen in expectancy. Speak, O blessed Master, in this quiet hour. Let me see thy face, Lord, feel thy touch of power. For the words thou speakest, they are life indeed, living bread from heaven, now my spirit feed. 
Distinguishing Loneliness and Solitude, that was Gateway to Joy 18, part four of the Path of Loneliness series. Before we go, let's hear from a friend of Elizabeth, a writer, who knew the five wives of those killed in Operation Alka. Della talks about the legacy of Elizabeth Elliot. Unless we revive her writings, because I can't recommend her enough, and I'll tell you too, Mike, that, you know, I just got a book. We have all these women's uh, Bible studies at churches uh, throughout the country. And I'm always interested to see the books that they're using. And I have to tell you, some of them are just, they're so self-serving. This was the thing about Elizabeth, okay? She taught objectively. She taught about the Lord and about God in her life, and it was not uh, self-serving teaching. Writer Della Healy, a friend of Elizabeth. Thank you, Della. Hey, let me thank you for letting us come into your home, maybe at your office, maybe as you uh, jogged or drove. Thank you for letting us uh, be a part of your day today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org. More talks, devotionals, Gateway to Joy programs, and more. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms.